Okay. So if, if there's still some person by some miracle still watching this. Yes. Here we are. <laughs> we are amazing. We have made a video. Rich Tong understands viewports like no other human. And we got real sync. When I lift my hand up, it works. Okay, Dion. Nice. So, uh, so this is like our first step. So if you don't know, if you know everything about uh, large language models, if you have written uh, archive papers, you don't need to see this, right? This is for like when we, you and I started. Remember how amazing this was? And we did an mm. intuition almost a year ago, Dion. This, I looked at it. March of 2023 was our first intro to this. Remember that moment? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It was, a it was, lot has happened since then. Yeah. So I think this is... The design of this is to just give you some intuition as to what is actually happening because there's so many things slammed around. If you want to sort of semi understand and have an intuition for what a large language model is, this one hour is for you. Okay. That's good. Well, let's start with um, uh, a quote. So, back in March of 2023, uh, Kevin Scott, CTO of Microsoft, did a podcast with Bill Gates and he said, GPT is maybe more significant than the PC, the internet, or mobile. That, I mean, we've lived through all these things. What do you think, Dion? True, false? I think it's true. Yeah. I, I think it's true. It's very hard to predict the future. You know, if that was possible, then I would probably not be sitting here. I'll be on some other weird alien planet. But um, I think it's possible. If you look at what the PC, the internet, and mobile has done, and if you see the amount of value that these generative AI transformer-based technologies has delivered in such a short time span, I don't think this is far off. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's quite likely. And what we're here to do is basically explain why and give you just a little intuition about what's going on. So in a nutshell, um, this is a part of a multi-part series. Uh, we've already done the decodering and predictions for 2023. This is really about the history of AI and to give you some intuitions. We also have a third part, which is a practicum that I think we're gonna have to do pretty quickly. Uh, we've built some tools that I think make it a lot easier to use this stuff. And uh, we're, we wanna share that with people as well. So here we go. Okay, let me first say, um, what the hell is a generative, what is ChatGPT? It's a generative pre-trained transformer, GPT. And it is either a stochastic parrot, that is all it does is memorize things and doesn't know anything, or it is the future of the world, which is artificial general intelligence and is a robot that will kill us all. I kind of think it's somewhere in between, don't you? I mean, it's not, it's neither just a repeater and it's not also not the, you know, it's not the Terminator. It's really yeah. something that, you know, you can learn in an hour, you can demo in a day. I mean, it's amazing how fast we're, we're pumping these solutions out, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah, I, I also think it's, it's somewhere in between because, you know, there's a lot of very interesting research going on at the moment about like these um, emergent properties from, from the LLMs. And yeah. it, it's kind of logical if you look at, you know, humans, we, we convey what we are um, through storytelling verbally, you know, yeah. written down. And if you train a, you know, a neural network essentially on human written words and, you know, speech these days and all sorts of text, I mean, it, it's not hard to, to see you, you, um, how you can have human traits in a way emerge from this because it's kind of implicitly captured in the training corpus. No, I totally agree with you. But AGI, it's definitely not. Yet. No, it's not. Gosh. Thank God. Don't worry yet. Don't worry. You can worry later. Yeah. So um, one of the things that's important is that artificial intelligence isn't just this. There's, a, there's actually a super long history of uh, how artificial intelligence worked. So on, the chart on the red shows early AI research, and there was symbolic reasoning, which we'll talk about, then machine learning, which is automatic learning, then deep learning. And then there are these fields like visual AI, natural language processing, image classification. And you see this little thing way down on the bottom, that's GPT. So when we talk about GPT, it is not all of AI. I just want to comment here that this chart was actually generated by a large language model. And in fact, the pre-prompt was create from left to right in mermaid.js, note parentheses and titles and directions to create a PNG with 200 pixel fonts 
in forest green theme. And the prompt was summary of AI developments. Now that stuff at the top sure looks like programming to me, doesn't it? I mean, hmm. no human's going to generate that. And that is sort of the magic. You can tell these things to do things. And this actually generated automatically this, but a lot of the magic is in this pre-prompt, the, the stuff that's hidden from you, that's the real engineering. And th those are some of the things we're working on. Hmm. It's, it's, hard to, it's hard to get those, those, those prompts right, don't you think, Dion? It's more like programming than it is like just talking. Yeah, no, that's, that's for sure. It is, it, 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 it's strange. It is like programming, but you're using a very loose um form of a programming language that's kind of just like natural yeah. human language yeah it is a very strange thing to wrap your head around yeah that's it, for sure it, you know if you're an english major you think it's easy and then you discover how hard it is if you're a programmer you're looking for the semicolons and the commas and the dashes and all that stuff and it's just like programming in, in english or any language in fact yeah so just to go all the way back um ai 1.1 you know basically it's all started in the 50s and it was, it's now called good old fashioned AI, also known as an expert system. And the idea was pretty simple. Well, I know how to fly an airplane around. So I'm going to hand define things like objects, like an aircraft, the relationships, like clothes, rules. And then you basically uh, write code. And this is an example of an AI system. When I was in uh, college, uh, actually in graduate school, I actually wrote one of these things. Here are the rules mm. for flying an airplane. And you can almost read it. Aircraft A at position 100, 200, 300, a speed of 200, heading of 300. Aircraft B is over here. And the relationship you're looking for is, are the two close? And then mm. you define a rule saying, please avoid a collision, which is in essence, if they're in the same heading and the same altitude and same position, if they're close, you can see this thing down at the bottom, then you should adjust their altitude. And mm. people spent decades working on this stuff. It's hard, it's brittle. It was really hard to do. And the biggest conceptual breakthrough was we don't have to do this. In fact, here is how all the AI we're talking about actually works. It's basically thinking of the world as a series of weights. So I have here an illustration of an airplane, right? And of a bird. And if you taught the, and I, you know, I have three kids, if you showed this to a kid who's like two, they would say they're both birds. I mean, they look the same, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the way to think about AI is it's basically a program that says, okay, if I see image one, is it a bird or a plane? If it's 1.0, that means I'm 100% sure it's a bird, right? Mm -hmm. And if I see a, a and in this case, uh, you know, I just grew up and they look the same. They're both black. They're both so forth. So I'm going to guess they're both birds, mm -hmm. right? Now, the interesting thing is what we do is training. And what we say is we label the data and we say, oh, one is the thing on the top is a bird is a plane and the thing on the bottom is a bird and haven't you ever seen kids completely confused it's like 50 50 is a bird or a plane and they go i confuse i'll guess i don't know what it is mm -hmm. and so what happens is this little matrix is changing right so the matrix used to be certain one 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 oh one oh now it's like 50 50 everywhere so this to read the chart it says if this image comes in it's 50 percent that is a bird or plane it's 50 percent if it's a bird it's 50 percent it's an image and this is what's called weights this is this idea that when things come in, we change our point of view. And training is, in essence, changing how those weights work. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, after enough training, you might say, oh, when I see something that's a plane, and by the way, um, I think us humans know what probably it is, right? We're 90% sure it's a plane, but it could be a bird, and it's probably mm -hmm. a plane. And this image is probably a bird, right? So it's 10% a plane and 90% a bird. So weights, it's a very analog thing. It's all about probabilities. Mm. And the, the thing that's interesting about machine learning is how did it figure out the difference between birds and planes? Like just looking at this, Dion, you can intuit why we think one's a bird and a plane, right? One has straight lines, right? It's got an engine in it. Others curvy. It's got feathers. And even though they're exactly the same size, by the way, I did this so that they're exactly the same size. There are other features mm. that tell you that it's different. Right? Exactly. And Break it up into smaller features, and then that's what it basically looks for. Kind of like what you're doing as a human in a way, because the first thing I look for is, oh, one has little stubby things on the wings. That's probably engines. The other one doesn't. Yeah. So one yeah. is probably a plane. The other is a bird. And, and the amazing thing, I think, Dion, is we didn't tell it to look for engines and feathers. We just said that's a bird and that's a plane a thousand times over. 
Don't you think that's the most amazing part of this? Is like just by looking at images and changing these magic weights, it gets good. But how did you how did you train your kids? Did you point out individual features, or did you just tell them this point. elephant, 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 and they say, "Oh, that's elephant, and that's a potato." Uh, there's been a lot of work that says this is exactly how we learn. We don't mm. like when you're doing air collision. You don't learn by writing rules. You learn by here's an example. Don't do this. Right? Yeah. So I think that there's there's some theory that we're really mimicking how this works. And by the way, these weights also the inspiration was from neuro you know neural networks is a brain idea which is our neurons when they're connected they don't do one or zero they're like oh i'll give you a little voltage i'll give you a little power so it is mm. that's what's inspired the whole thing mm. so the funny thing is no one could figure out how to do this for 50 years because you have to so, show so many examples and so much time and then appeared the pc and so the big breakthrough it's 12 hours. was actually in 1989 by a name, guy named Jan LeCun, who's today, by the way, head of AI research for Meta. And what he said is uh, he built the first thing called a convolutional neural network. And what it does is, um, if you look at the, the chart on the upper right, there's the letter A. And what it does is it looks through little pieces of it, and it learns what's in there. And all of these weights inside, these are called hidden layers, are learning all those little ideas. Right now, the funny thing is we didn't teach it what it was doing. We just said, learn some things and we feed it a bunch of A's. And so the interesting thing is this is called connectionism. There are no objects, there are no rules, they're just matrices. And what mm -hmm. convolutions do is they search through the features and then encode them. And then you see towards the end, this is the summarization mm -hmm. that says, given all these internal features, so somewhere in here is buried, A's have two lines like this and a line across. We don't, Here's the amazing thing, Dion. We don't know where that is. There, we can't tell, right? Mm. I find this so bizarre that this works. I mean, it is completely crazy that it works, but it really does. And there's this idea of training with gradient descent, which is basically when you make those mistakes, you say, oh, I made a mistake. How do I shift my weights around so I'm closer? Mm. And so basically a lot of this training, you go around and around, and the weights keep changing, the matrix keeps changing, and eventually the accuracy gets good. Um, so mm. the interesting thing about this is you, you see these things in the middle. Mm -hmm. Turns out if you're recognizing letters and things, and then you switch it to recognizing donkeys, you can actually leave these things the same, and you can just say at the back, tell me if it's a donkey. And this is called transfer learning. And so what you mm. basically do is you unfreeze the back that does the summarization, and the middle still has the features. So conceptually, you know, donkey is furry, it's not straight, and so forth. So all those concepts of furry and straight or what's in these so-called hidden layers. Mm. Every time I explain this, I feel like it's a miracle. Do you feel that way, Dion? Like it's Yeah, it's it's quite amazing and you know, but it also depends on like the the type of data you have, like how clean that is when you train yeah. it because you can very easily get garbage in, garbage out uh, type yeah. responses. Yeah. And it, but man, it, I feel like some of these frameworks and algorithms have gotten so good in the last I want to say year to year and a half yeah. that um, they they seem to be more robust, and I'm going out on the limb saying yeah. this, but more robust to dirty data than what we've seen before. Yeah, I don't I, know if you if you have the same I, feel. I, I think what's happening is, um, you know, the first network ever done called LeNet had seven layers in it and had a 28 percent mm. error rate, which was by the way world breaking in 1989, and required a gigantic computer. But look what happened in this arms race, and that's what's happened is that the number of layers, e.g. the number of things we can store has gone up exponentially. So we went to eight with AlexNet, then two years later we had 19, ResNet was at 152 layers, like all, mm -hmm. like all of these features. So it's hard to realize that that's a huge increase, right? A 20x mm -hmm. increase in the amount you can store. Uh, it's also interesting to note that Andre Karpathy, who's one of our you know, insightful people, he actually took the test that we're using here, which is basically to recognize objects, and he had a 5% error rate. Like he looked at a donkey and he saw, thought it was a horse. So these things mm. rapidly became better at recognizing things than humans. Mm. Just, by, just by having multiple layers. So the bottom one shows ResNet, which was invented by Microsoft, and it has 152 layers down in the lower right that does the image recognition. So incredible work. 
And the funny thing is all networks work the same way, plus or minus. So if you understand this basic and are willing to take the leap with us that this works, you want to actually understand most of what's going on in GPT. Give it a lot of training data, have a gigantic set of matrices, give it lots of examples, it makes lots of mistakes, and then it gets better. Mm. Now, on the other side, um, and that was just for images. That was like looking at little image swatches. On the other side, there was text recognition and use something called a recurrent neural network. And this is like the Rosetta Stone thing. You know, the, the problem was if you say, I am a person, and you want to encode it into je suis en person, the problem is, um, you know, the word order shifts, right? Things are changing. And so a recurrent neural network is like a Rosetta Stone. And it takes sequential text and says, given this piece of text, predict the next one. Right. And it's interesting that you can use this for so many things. Uh, if you have, say, one input and many, you can say, give me a note, make a full song. So that's how this generative thing works. Just give me a little bit and give me the most likely sequence that comes after that. You can do it many to one, which is read a whole corpus. And the answer can be, is he angry? So that's sentiment analysis. And the example up on the right you see is called many to many. You take a bunch of translations and then you uh, say, this sequence of four let words equals this sequence. So scientists are really good at taking a big problem and making it the same. And this recurrent mm -hmm. idea, um, the, the trick, unlike convolutional ne neural networks, is memory. So this is an illustration of something called long short term memory. And what it does is when you look at the outputs like I am a person, what happens is that it actually stores key things, right? These context units. It says, oh, like in this thing, I and a person are the most important words to understand, to do the correct translation. And it stores those things, and then it has those input things that are understanding the rules and relations. And this kind of thing is amazing, but it has the problem that it can be quite slow because you've got to keep iterating and iterating and iterating. So CNNs and RNNs basically blew away all of the old translation schemes. So this idea of like, je is a pronoun, I is a pronoun, that's how people used to do it. And this thing got rapidly much better. Mm. Yep. Mm. So then what happened was, um, and I, you know, I didn't tell you the real trick. Recurrent neural networks don't operate on words. Right? Don't, every time I, you know how we show all these examples like I and the, right? Yeah. There is no I and the in this thing at, at all. The, in yeah. fact, the representation, mm. it turns out, is the most important thing to get right in neural networks. Right? In this case, um, it's this it was a paper written by the guys at Google many years ago. And it had this amazing idea that if you took the word King, K-I-N-G, instead of representing it as four letters, you would instead create a, th a 500 to a thousand element vector that represented the word King, right? And these vectors have this amazing property that if you add the vector for Paris to the vector for the word France and subtract the vector for the word London, you get the you get the token or the word UK. I still to this day, every time I explain it, it seems like, how does that actually work? But if you can yeah. do this kind of math, you can actually say, and the intuition here, by the way, is somewhere in that thousand vector thing is capitals. And another one is this idea of countries. And Paris has embedded in it the vector for France. And so when you add Paris and France together, what you're saying is, I want capitals that are in France. And when you subtract London, that's this notion of a capital. And so you get the vector that means a country, right? Mm -hmm. So somewhere in there, it's magically learned these rules and relationships. And I think the interesting thing about it is there's a bunch of techniques called a word to vec or glove that use something called cosine similarity. And that's illustrated in the bottom. So it basically says if there's some magical vector for the word J down on the right, and there's something for person one. And you can actually say, how similar is J's vector to person one's vector? If it's very mm -hmm. similar, it's 1.0, it's the same person. Like for instance, if it was J Dion, you, and your brother, that vector would be very high because it would have learned a bunch of attributes about like Blau is the same name and so forth. But if you turn to take it to another person, person two, you might get a negative, which means it's definitely not like that. So like the vector for Rich Tong versus Dion, obviously, you're smart and handsome and I'm not. So obviously it would be a negative vector because it would be correlated. We know that. Obviously. Obviously. Mm -hmm. And yeah. one of the key ideas is that uh, you hear a lot of things about vector databases. 
the thing that you need to understand is what's really happening is they're doing this kind of embedding for phrases and chunks of documents. So what they're really saying is this entire chunk, like 400 words, how much is it like in this vector sense, like another chunk? Right, That's so it right. adds up all of the vectors for that 400 chunk, and you can actually do this math that says, "Oh, this this thing, how much is it like the other thing?" I think someone should get a, a PhD, you know, get a Nobel Prize for this, don't you? I mean, it's just such an amazing. Uh, I'm sure you thought of this, lat, you know, when you were eight years old, right, Dion? It just you're uh -huh. just thinking one day, and you thought about multi-dimensional vectors, and you invented this uh, thing. cosine similarity. I mean, as you do. I mean, while you're playing with your red fire truck, you think of cosine yeah. similarity. I, I know, all those people in Namibia, they're so much, so much smarter than me. So That's how we roll. Now, here's the important thing. Um, uh, another uh, person who's been very key to this is Yashio Bengio. He, Yashio Bengio, um, Jan LeCun, and Jeffrey Hinton just won the uh, uh, the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for Computer Science for all these discoveries. And he, in a podcast, said, are embedding vectors the key to human knowledge? It's interesting to think about, right? When you think about a plane, there's so many attributes to a plane, but I know what a plane looks like. A toy plane is smaller, but that's just the attribute of toy in plane. And one, the interesting thing is to ask whether or not this embedding is really the key. It's pretty clear that RNNs would not work without this kind of embedding technology. So whenever you talk about neural networks. If you want to be smart in a cocktail party, you can just say, well, what, what is the embedding technology that you're using? And you'll be as smart as Dion. Yeah. Go for it. Or well, at the risk of embarrassing you, isn't your son working with Yashua Benjo at the moment? Uh, it's lab? one of the great privileges of life. How, heart bursting with pride. Yes, he's actually in Yashua's group. He does math. I don't understand. Uh, they're up, all up, up in Montreal, by the way, freezing to death. Uh, it's an amazingly impressive group. You need to be so mathematically oriented to understand these things, but we're here to give you intuition. <laughs> so let me give you another piece of intuition. What is a transformer? So there's a paper written in 2017, again, by the folks at Google. Remember that really complicated CNN part, the, the recurrent neural networks, all that memory stuff? The insight mm -hmm. was the memory part is the most important part. And so a transformer, which is in GPT and all the modern things, it, you just rip out all of that complex circling, and all you do is you think about the memory. And the intuition here is, if you see the animal on the right, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. The question that's always been hard is, what does the word it refer to? Yeah. Right? And what a transformer does, if you look on the right, there is a magic attention system that says, when I go to the word it on the right, what word should I pay attention to in the whole text? And this is not an actual example. The, the darker it is, the better. So, for instance, uh, it does, it's not paying attention, any attention to didn't and cross and the, but it is a pay, paying attention to the word animal, because it could be an animal, or the word street, or it's paying attention to itself. Right? Mm -hmm. In this particular case, when you do the training, what it says is, if, if you ask it, it says, oh, it's the street. You say, wrong, 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 wrong. It's not the street. It's the animal. So a, the transformer has learned that when it gets phrases like this, pay attention to the word animal. Mm. Isn't that the most incredible thing? That if you train this enough, you can actually teach it the word it means animal. And I love your example, because when you're teaching someone Afrikaans or English, you don't give them the grammar rules. Like, did you get the grammar rule book from your parents? Right? I don't think there's even such a thing in existence. Or maybe there is. I just don't know about it. Well, you're, you're you heathen. But the answer is, of course, they would say, no, you don't say it that way, Dion. It's yeah. the animal. And yeah. after enough learning, you learn it's the animal. So this is yeah. the, really the third revolution of AI, which, is, which started with just guessing the next token, right? And a large language model, hint, is just a big transformer. All it's doing is guessing the next word based on the previous word, and we get so much out of it. And the bitter lesson of AI is we just suck at engineering. I mean, we, you know, all this work, like recurrent network, network had 154 layers. Transformers are, everything's blank. It's just the same thing. They're called multi-level perceptrons. There is no construction of the layering system, right? It just learns the layers and what it should do. So we literally just feed it more examples and it figures it out. I still get a chill when I say this, like how could this possibly work? Yeah, I know. Like what, what I always think about is what would happen if you train a transformer network the same duration as you would 
train a human child. So let's say you train it over, let's say, 10 years. Yeah. Um, would you be able to, in a complete dark room, distinguish between that transformers responses and a human child of the age of 10 years' responses? Well, that that's the amazing thing is that we're actually doing no work ex except showing that the computer in the dark a bunch of examples and it learns stuff. Yeah. Oh, my God. Okay, so here's the amazing, it's going to get even more amazing. There's something called a visual transformer. So transformers ate re uh, recurrent neural networks. Visual transformers ate convolutional net neural networks in 2020. The idea is pretty simple. Instead of that little piece, you just feed 16 by 16 pieces of images to a transformer, and it recognizes things. It turns out just those, that little bit is recognizing little pieces. There's no layer engineering. The image pieces, in fact, are turned into embeddings. It's the same idea. Take this little piece of image, turn it into a vectorized embedding, and then figure out what it is. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's two pieces. One is compute, turning it into an embedded vector and then feeding it to a recurrent neural network. And Dino in 2021 was one of the first visual transformers. And here's the remarkable thing. You don't even have to tag it. If you feed it a bunch of pictures of drafts, it just says, well, I don't know what the hell it is, but they're all the same. You feed a bunch of pictures of airplanes. It says, I don't know what that is, but it's all the same. And it actually works for people too. You don't know what a fire engine is, but if you see a lot of red trucks in America, it, they're all the same. If you see a bunch yep. of yellow trucks in the UK, you don't know what they are, but they're all the same. So this thing is really learning in a very deep way. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So um, that was, by the way, astounding in 2020. Right. So um, summary, when they say large language model, it's just really a big ass transformer. Mm -hmm. The real secret is all this is a scale up from those two ideas. So if you understand that, you have all the intuition you need to understand everything that's going on. So when people talk about training data with GPT, what they're talking about, if you give it enough data, it learns how to write Shakespeare. Who would have thought that? Yeah. Um, and I just want to comment on this, particularly last year, there was just like, it's just too freaking simple. How, how, how can you just take the internet and predict the next word? There's no way you can form emerging. How many times did we hear this, Dion? It's like, that's so simple. There's no possible way that this mm. could work. And I just want to give you some intuition about that. And um, the two examples are the fact that this, this idea of emergence, you can have very simple rules and you can create very complex behaviors. And I want to thank Dion for this because he gave me the inspiration on this. So there's something called John Conway's Game of Life. It only has four rules. It's a cell game. It says, if there's not enough, cell, if there's not enough people living next to you, you die. If there's just enough, you live. If there's too many, you die. If there's just the right amount, you birth another one. On the left, this is what happens with those four rules. It's amazing. People have been studying this for 20 years, almost actually 40 years, you can actually create living things that replicate. This is a glider production. Just by starting in these rules, you create very complex objects, right? And it gets more and more complicated over time. You can have two gliders fighting each other. So emergence, even with simple rules, is very, very um, powerful, an idea. Uh, Boyd's algorithm, which comes from birds, thank you, Dion, for pointing this out, only has three rules, right? I mean, I think you use this in one of your systems. Is that right, Dion? Yeah, that's right. We used this Boyd's algorithm in an art piece for an art studio called Studio Drift, where we programmed swarms of drones to basically exhibit the Boyd's behavior. It is the idea was to mimic um, starling flocking behavior. But the great thing is when you program each little drone, um, these very simplistic rules around separation, alignment, and cohesion, Only the result... Rules. In, yeah, only three rules. The resulting emerging behavior looks like a, a large organism almost moving through the sky. Absolutely. It's, Absolutely. It, it's amazing. And if you look on the left, uh, we we're just letting that Conway game of life run. I mean, this thing looks like a living being. Hmm. I mean, look at this. Four rules. That's all it took. Three rules on the other side. So I think one of the things we need to realize is even if the rules are very simple, you can get very complex emergent behavior. 
That's right. And if you look at, so, you know, on my um, Mac locally, I can open an application called LM Studio and I can run a large language model like the one that's released by Meta, the Llama 2 model. Yep. It's a 70 billion parameter model and it only takes 40 gigabytes of space on the laptop. Yep. Now, you can ask it questions around a lot of topics that's in Wikipedia, a lot of topics that's on, on the internet and all of this like um, raw information out there that it was trained on. But it's only a 40 gigabyte model in size, but yeah. it seems to know information that does not fit into 40 gigabytes. Yeah. So that means there is something more going on than simple token prediction. It's, it can't be compression. It's, simple, yeah. it's not, yeah. It 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 it's it 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 can be compression either, but it's 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 kind of like it forms um it has an understanding of 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 topics um and 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 concepts. And then similar to a human, it we don't have like one-to-one -one memory no. recall, we don't have no. photographic memories, we kind of interpolate between concepts, and it seems more and more that's what it's doing. So it Absolutely. is Kind of compression, like and and Andrew Kampathy talks about like lossy compression, yeah. and that's also where hallucinations sometimes come in. Right, right. I, I, it, it's kind of like the same AGI versus stochastic yeah. parrot yeah. conversation again. It's somewhere yeah. in between. Yeah, and and you can actually argue that you know we're older than fifteen. There's no we compressed everything we've ever learned as a JPEG, no. right? I mean, there are rules. And yeah. here's my favorite example. So this is our son Al Calvin on the left. And this is Alex on the right. And I actually said this to him when there were three. I said, Alex is allergic, so he doesn't have to drink milk. So Calvin re replies immediately, well, then I'm allergic to water. And Perfect. you can actually see the learning here, right? He doesn't <laughs> want to drink the water, so he just inserted the word milk. And like you said, Dion, you do enough training, and you know you wait 25 years, and you get this emergent behavior, which is you get people who are working at Meta and Mila. This is this is Calvin working on a advanced um, uh, neuro implant technology for sensing motion. And then here's Alex at the Montreal Institute for uh, Learning Algorithms. And so we do this all the time in humans. So is mm -hmm. it that crazy that it can happen in, in computers? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the question is, what emerges from an LLM? And I think the way to understand this is LLMs appear to have, and all, all machine learning things appear to have three different things that they learn. The first is they learn about features, things, and then they learn about rules and relationships between them, and then they combine the rules and relationships to figure out, oh, that's Dion. Right? Like, how do I know that's Dion? Well, the first thing you know is you recognize lighter color, you notice hair and so forth. And then the relationships are, if it's lighter color and hair and has a cool accent and super handsome, that must be Dion. That's how we work. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, everyone has that algorithm programmed. So <laughs> it turns out this is actually, it appears as though that's what's actually happening in Transformers. Now we can't know exactly what's going on because those layers are opaque, but people have actually mm -hmm. torn apart these things and said in the lower layers, just tell me what's active. So in this particular case, um, for instance, the word basketball at 95%, this is the, the original image is here. And this is internally, sorry, if I hit a button too fast, it's a problem. It says, I'm paying more attention to the basketball thing in the back and to the ball. <clears throat> when it looks at a beacon, it's paying attention to the stripes. When it sees a bear, it's a paying attention to the middle. So you can actually see it's actually identifying features and it's paying more attention to certain things than others. And when mm. you see it making mistakes, you learn like it's 29% this is a starfish and you ask why, it's paying attention to those, um, to that little five starred thing, right? Mm. And the golden retriever, it's wondering because it sees the dog, but it sees these other pieces, mm. right? So what you're seeing is that uh, we think what's happening is the lower levels understand things like it's a structure like a hubcap or five stars, and the layer layers, later layers try to classify it. And that appears to be what's going on. It's interesting if you look at like the black bear, it 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 um pays attention to the face and the and and and, and the feet. Yeah. So that's how it can distinguish between a black bear and a black dog. 
Yep. But it will have a hard time if it doesn't see the rest of the dog because the proportions are, are all out. The snout is different. Yeah. And that's also coincidentally the first thing that a human would look at. If you have a black bear and a black dog and you just look at their backs yeah. at yep, some right. distance, it yeah. could be very hard if you don't have a sense of scale. Yeah. Yeah. Right up until he right up until the point the black bear eats you, you won't really know. That is one advantage we have over the machines. <laughs> yes, we have that extra sensory input. If your arm is bitten off, it's kind of a giveaway. Uh huh. No, but I think this is a great point. And you can see if you train enough examples, it looks like it's doing somewhat what humans are doing, which is looking for basic features and understanding rules and relationships. Mm -hmm. um, here's another interesting uh, example of that. So this example uh, shows a visual transformer called a VIT on the left. And on the right is a. Uh, a specific ResNet 5 that was hand coded with all the layers. And what we did was we, what, it, what this paper did was it said, show me all the layers in VIT and show me what's being activated and show me the same layers in ResNet 50. And they're remarkably similar, right? And what it implies is inside a transformer, it actually grew a, a convolutional neural network inside of it without okay. any training. It just like figured it out. Right, it shows the same activation pat pattern. So this is suggestive of the fact that what's happening in transformers is this idea that it is actually learning how to make a CNN or an RNN or these other pieces just by seeing all the examples. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me give you an interesting example here. So if you were to say um, what's inside, it's hard not to believe that really if you look at this python program which is if a is greater than two b is equal to two that abstract symbol tables and word frequencies are what's happening so for instance if i i said to uh, this llm write it as hip-hop and it says yo if a be greater than two said b equal to two that's what we do and what's happening mm -hmm. is hip-hop has a certain word frequency right mm -hmm. and certain word characteristics this python program also has characteristics if you merge them together that's what you get, mm. right? You get the word choices of hip hop, think about embedding vectors, and you get the semantics, the abstract symbol table of Python. When you say as Shakespeare, hark if, if tis true that an A be greater than two, then let B be set to two forsooth. That's because forsooth and the word Shakespeare are very highly correlated. So the machine learning model, we think saw forsooth a lot. If you were to use the word Shakespeare, oh, I'm gonna stick those two together. Uh, by the way, you can write it in Algol 68, you can write it as Lisp, and you can even write it as, in the style of Lincoln. So all of these things are just transformations, but if you look at them, the same abstract idea is there, it's just the word choices that are changing. I still find this remarkable, don't you, Dion, that this works? Uh, it's amazing. If you look at the Lincoln one, you know, four score and seven years ago, if it be true that A is greater than two, then it behooves us to set B to two forthwith. That fourth with part is always very interesting to me because it shows in the if statement, like the conclusion of the if statement is fourth with do yeah, some action. Exactly right. Set two equal to B. And it kind of encapsulated that in a very strange and eerie way. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. yet very interesting way. Yeah. Yes. And that's what's in the rules and relationships work. Mm. Uh, let me give you another example. Um, you know, there, it, it's already been shown that um, these things are what are called Turing complete. Now, Turing is a very interesting idea. Uh, down here below is the original first computer, 18,000 transistors in 1945. Turns out they all emulate the same idea which Alan Turing, may rest in peace, invented, which is the simple idea that you can make any kind of con computational device if you have a conceptual piece of tape, you have a read-write head and a program. And Turing completeness means that any machine that's Turing capable can complete something. And so in any act with 18,000 transistors is conceptually the same as this DGX H100 with 2.5 trillion transistors because it's Turing complete. Put another way, given enough time, you can compute anything with that ENIAC than you can with the, with the DGX H100. It's a very deep result. And it's interesting that transformers have been shown to be Turing complete. That is, they have memory inside them. They have programs in a tape. So theoretically, a Turing machine can, uh, a transformer can do anything that any computer can do. And that's a very deeply theoretic idea. So it's far beyond this idea of a stochastic parrot. E.g., the mm -hmm. emergent behavior is such that you can compute anything that can be computed by any other device. 
Mm-hmm. Th- this sort of gives me trills to, to realize that Aaron Tur- that Alan Turing was so smart. Just think about things like a tape and a head and a program. I mean, that is. Yeah. I'm sure you figured that out too with your with your red train set too. I'm sure, you were wondering oh, yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah. Computability yeah. was at the top of your list. Uh huh. So um, one of the interesting demos, and I this I want to thank you for this, Dion, is the emulation of Unix or Linux inside a VM. Maybe you can explain this. I still think this is one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen. Yeah, this is quite crazy. And it, this is also like a, a really old by now. I need to see if this still works. But you basically instruct it. You, you tell the LLM you want it to act as a Linux virtual machine. Um, and, and, and then you, you tell it, you know, whenever you ask it to sudo app install, that it should do things. Um, so you basically tell it that it's a Linux machine and you explain what that is. It, of course, knows what a Linux machine is. But then it goes and acts like a Linux machine. You can use Linux commands, ls, you know, to look at the folders. You can install Python, like what's happening here. And um, it's literally acting similar to Linux. Now, of course, a lot of this is just based off of its own knowledge, and some of it might be hallucinated because it's just making stuff up. But it's very interesting to see how um, you can change the behavior of this large language model by just using the right instructions. In 12, or the 30. Tuning prompts, let's yeah. say. Yeah, and, and I think the, I'm not sure it really has a Unix operating system inside, but you can see the power of, having all these words similar, it actually, it looks like it's running a Python script. I mean, it's kind of amazing. Yes, after you've installed Python, <laughs> now you can type Python like in Linux and then it then it acts like it has Python. Um, it's amazing. And in this case, um, we assign some numbers to variables. Yeah. Like A is equal to one, B is equal to two, and then C is equal to A plus B. And then you want to print C and then it gives you three, exactly how it would happen if you're using Linux and installed Python and run Python in Linux. Now so it, it saw so many examples of that, that it could actually emulate it good enough such that it it, it, it can fool. If, if, if you don't know that this is an LLM, it can fool you in this very simple case where you would think that you're actually using Linux with Python. Right. And it, I think it, it's an illustration of we don't know what's going on in there but it's learning a lot. And this is just with GPT 3.5 a year ago, by the way. It'd be interesting Definitely. to see what happens now. Yeah. Okay, let's do, let's do one more example. Hello? So this is the... Yeah, yeah. sorry, I'm, I, it's, it's skipping like crazy. Okay, yeah. one way to think about this is, you know, these large language models are trillions of parameters. It's so hard to understand it. One intuition you might have is, you can think of it as inside this thing is buried a CNN, inside is buried an RNN, inside is buried abstract symbol tables, and then it has a bunch of things it can do like translate and summarize and so forth. So one of the ways to think about this is what's really happening is uh, in a deep way that when I give it a prompt, different parts of the network are activating. So for instance, if I give it a prompt, What's happening, if I say like drone SQL, what's happening is this, oh, drone. Okay, I got it, got it, got it. I'm going to shut off all the stuff that knows about Taylor Swift. I'm going to shut off all the stuff that knows about the uh, Afrikaans and so forth. And I'm going to provide attention to these CNNs and RNNs and these ASTs, and then I'm going to run a translation. So when you're doing prompting, what, what you're really doing is you're actually doing programming. You're, you're telling it, pay attention to this word. So if you if you watch these things carefully, when I said the word Shakespeare, it's as though the CNN that un, the RNN that understands Shakespeare talk gets turned on, and that's why these language models get so big because you've got all of this stuff encoded in it. It's also one of the reasons we think that if you just say simply step, think step by step, it causes it to work differently because we think different things are inactivating inside this thing. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that's right. There's, there's actually papers published on this showing that the output becomes much more um, reliable and correct if you ask it to think step by step. But also, funny enough, if you tell it that it's really important you get this right, my job depends on it. Yeah. That also makes like a substantial difference in the output that's generated. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? 
thing. Now, just to sort of prove this, um, there was a paper that was done that was, I think, fascinating, which is if you feed an LM the word spider, a picture, this, a picture of a uh, emoji that's a spider, a picture of Spider-Man the movie, and a video, if you look deep inside the thing, the same activations, and by the way, an activation means you get 1.0, it's very high. It's actually the same activation deep inside the neural network which highly implies that there is like a spider neuron inside the thing and that all these things are about features. But in the end, the concept of a spider is deeply understood inside the large language model. Um, there's a simple example, which is uh, there's something called LLVM, which is a co the compiler that we use all the time. It actually works this way. It has an abstract symbol table. You can actually feed it 23 different languages and it compiles very efficiently all of them because all languages are sort of alike. And so the intuition here is we think this is what's happening inside of a transformer. Kind of crazy, every time I see this, I, it's like I can't believe it. It's like, My name is Miles Morales. I'm Brooklyn. Right. So um, let's talk a little bit about what's inside, our, inside a transformer deeply, just so you can get a sense for it, and then we'll sort of end the session. Transformers are very, very simple. They basically have, as we said, input. There's this attention mechanism. Feed forward means all of that relationship and rules in the final layer. That's all that's inside the thing, right? And so what's happening is the weights, the way these things are connected changes by learning. Hmm. So conceptually what's happening is, um, we showed this small example. This is the, the big example. You can actually, um, you can actually go online and find things and actually have the transformer show you, given the thing on the left, show me the thing on the right. So this says, the quick brown fox drove over my lazy old dog. And you can actually look at the attention layers. And you can see the the here and the the here are highly correlated. Now, here's a very mm -hmm. important idea. When I said there was an attention layer, I lied. There's actually eight different ones happening simultaneously. So when you give it to a transformer, eight different things it's looking at eight different things simultaneously and the intuition here is these things are learning different things to pay attention to so conceptually this looks like it looks like an identical word finder here this thing mainly pay attention to the next word it looks like that's the next word finder this thing only focuses on the end that looks like it's the end of text finder this is a start of text finder this is a comma finder and this we can't really even tell what it is so the same magic that happens in a transformer is, is happening in the attention layers. And it's very important to understand that programming of that is done just by training. We didn't tell it to pay attention to any of these things. It's changing the attention network based on what gives it more accurate outputs. Mm -hmm. Kind of crazy, Dion. That, that, that's, yeah, it just blows and, uh, me away. Yeah. When you're at that cocktail party, you can impress folks by telling them, you know, about multi-headed attention mechanisms. Yeah, That's you, you can say, uh, oh, yeah, no, I use eight-headed attention, and people are going to think you're a genius. Um, yeah. The last point Love I want to make before we end our session is this embedding thing also works on images. So, um, you know, diffusion models, I mean, we're using a lot of these generative AI things. We, we just made our logo with it, right? Yeah, that's right. And... I'll tell you, Dion, the math is impossible to understand. Like how, when you type the word, make this in the style of Van Gogh, like how could it even possibly freaking work? Uh, the math is very complicated, but I just want to give you some intuition for how it works. Here's what happens is, and you can see this, um, this is a Google uh, except of all things that are butterflies, right? And when you feed it this, these models, what they're learning is, what are butterflies? And I'll just make this up. What do you see here? A lot of bright blues, bright uh, bright oranges, seems to have four wings, green backgrounds, flowers, hands, and so forth, right? And just mm. staring at this as a human, you get a sense for what butterflies look like. I then typed in the word Renaissance art. Looks really different, doesn't it? Grays, mm. portraits, long hair, faces, brown. And so basically, the intuition here is that the so-called UNET works like a CNN. It converts an image of a butterfly into an embedding. This is the secret. It's always about embeddings. You never feed it the JPEG. You know, when you upload the JPEG, you know, you think, oh, I'm just feeding it a JPEG. You're not doing that. You're actually feeding it to something that's creating an embedding of that object. Hmm. And the intuition here is that embedding has, we don't know what, like things like, oh, bright blue, things like wings. And there's many, many dimensions. 
And so a butterfly, it understands very deeply, right? It understands the word idea of Renaissance art deeply because Renaissance art has a certain look. It uses certain colors, certain objects, and so forth. And then um, what we're really saying is when you say butter like da Vinci, you're just merging those two vectors together, mm. right? And the trick is it's a lot faster than the CNN because it, and it, I don't want to go into the details, but it takes random noise and it quickly learns how to take any random object and turn it into something that follows that same embedding. So it can take random noise and turn it into a butterfly. And so what you're really seeing is when you, when you do these remarkable things is, uh, this is by way, the Google example, when you type in Renaissance art and butterfly, I think you have some intuition for what's happening, right? Those butterflies look like butterflies, got four wings, but the color palette's totally different, mm. right? So that is the, the generative AI thing. It uses this exact same trick. And I think we've learned in the session what they are. We, just to summarize, we've learned that what's happening is you take things in the real world, you convert it into this embedding vector, and then you teach it over and over again in a transformer what the heck's going on. Mm. Well, what do you think, Dion? Do we do a pretty good job? I think we did an amazing job. I, oh, I, this I, is a much shorter session than the, than the second session. I hope that we can link the second session in the show notes, like all the cool oh, presenters do on YouTube. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. You're going to show me how to do that. I, I, you taught me, you taught me how to do chapter marks, so then I'm going to learn linking. This is my <laughs> next thing. Thank you very nice. much, Dion, for all this. Um, I want to thank you again for uh, helping uh, me on this journey, because it's really complicated. Oh, yeah. I'm not um, really doing much. <laughs> I think we're <laughs> all figuring this out, you know, because it's, it's such an exciting time in the tech industry, right? You know, um, for me, it, it was kind of sad that the brightest minds of our generations were like working on getting more eyeballs on websites and getting more clicks and likes. And now we've got so much brain oh. juice, like pouring all over this like brand new technology that's that's really delivering value. And of course, there's a there's a dark side to it. There is a bad side to it. Like with any new technology, there's good and bad. Um, yeah. But I'm very excited to be in this space and, you know, to play with this and to see like all of the exciting problems we can solve for real humans using this technology. I think that's the best part. Oh, absolutely. Well, we're going to do some more. Um, we have a section on practicum. Uh, we're going to cover probably hardware was another request. Like what is all this then about NVIDIA and so forth? But thank you, Dion, yeah. for spending the time. It's midnight over there. I hope you watch a good show. And, yeah, uh, we'll do. Talk to you soon. <laughs> Okay, Rich. Bye, Dion. Till the next one. All right. We sound so good together, man. Jesus. It sounds <laughs> like we know what the fuck we're talking about. I added. I forgot I added those diffusion slides because it yeah. was just so... Under yeah, a lot of that is actually pretty outdated. Like, I was looking at it like oh, we yeah. can... We should actually...